Thank you very much for coming to the talk. I'll tell you something about the black hole information paradox, something I have been working on for a very long time. It's a really fascinating problem. And the face on the right there is probably very familiar to you. Uh, maybe the most famous face in physics today, Stephen Hawking. And you know that he found something very interesting about black holes, a paradox. And that's what I would like to tell you about. But the story actually begins a little before that with the work of Jacob Bekenstein, two or three years before, who found that black holes exhibit a very puzzling link to the field of thermodynamics. So there was already a kind of puzzle before Hawking. And then Hawking found a really serious puzzle. He found that black holes are not only interesting because they link to thermodynamics, they actually violate quantum mechanics. And that is a very serious problem, because quantum mechanics we all know and love, and we have to resolve this puzzle. What I want to show you is that with string theory, in fact, we can now perhaps resolve Hawking's puzzle. And what ends up happening is that the puzzle that Bekenstein found, it comes back in a way to help out with the problem that Hawking was having. And so somehow both the puzzles go away together. But in the process, something rather uh, strange happens. Whatever we thought the black hole was like, it actually ends up having a structure which is radically different. So in fact, when you resolve this long-standing puzzle, you also learn something very deep about the nature of space, time, quantum gravity, and thermodynamics. So let's start on this uh, uh, incredible story. So let's just begin with something very simple. What is a black hole? So you know that gravity just makes everything attract everything else. So everything is trying to collapse towards each other. So if you take something like the sun, which is a huge, massive object, why doesn't the whole thing just attract itself and shrink down to a point? Well, we know the answer to that one. There's nuclear fusion going on. The core is very hot. That creates a pressure that balances the attraction of gravity. And you get the sun. And in fact, the sun doesn't have too much of a density. The overall average density is just like the density of water. But you know, if you have the sun with all this uh, nuclear fusion going on, at some point, all the fuel will get exhausted. Now there's nothing to maintain the heat. And then something like this would have to start collapsing. What's going to help it uh, stop it from collapsing any further? Well, you know that in quantum mechanics, the electrons, which are found in every atom uh, inside the sun, uh, they are actually really waves. And here I have a picture of the electrons as waves. And you also know by the Pauli exclusion principle that two electrons don't want to overlap. Their waves want to stay away from each other. So everything can't really come to a point, not because they are moving very fast like is in the sun, the particles, but really because of quantum mechanics, they can't overlap. That's called electron degeneracy pressure. Electrons can't be degenerate because of quantum mechanics. The whole thing shrinks a lot, comes down to a size of about 10,000 kilometers and one cubic centimeter, a sugar cube sized object of this weighs about one ton. You can try to imagine lifting a sugar cube of the material made out of this object, which is called the white dwarf. And there's a picture. This is a star, but then here is a little white dwarf. It's called Sirius B. And that's an example of something like this. What if the mass was even more and the electron degeneracy pressure couldn't really hold it off from compressing? Well, in fact, then what happens is in the atom, the electrons, and there are also protons around from the initial atom that made up the star, well, they get pushed into each other. And this is a negative charge object, this is a positive star charge object, and they make neutrons and some antineutrinos that fly away. But the neutrons are also waves, and they also satisfy a Pauli exclusion principle. The waves, of course, are much smaller now because the object is heavier, and heavier objects have smaller waves. But now, because the neutrons can't get into each other, well, the thing can't collapse any further, and the whole thing is balanced by neutron degeneracy pressure. And now the whole thing has come down to a size of 20 kilometers, the size of a city. And one sugar cube size thing of this weighs 1 billion tons. So now you can have fun trying to imagine lifting a sugar cube worth of stuff, which is making up a neutron star. And there's some images of neutron stars somewhere in there, which uh, does very interesting things for us in astronomy. But our story really concerns the next step. If your mass was even larger and the neutron degeneracy pressure cannot hold you up, in fact, nothing can. 
and the whole thing gets a runaway collapse. It shrinks, and then that makes it denser. It shrinks even more, it gets further dense. Nothing can stop the collapse, and all the mass disappears into one point. That's what's called a black hole. We draw a little boundary around it here. Not that there's anything actually sitting here, but as you know, every object like the Earth has an escape velocity, about 11 kilometers per second. If you throw something with that speed, it will go away and never come back. But if this object had a bigger mass, you'd need a bigger escape velocity. For some critical mass, the escape velocity becomes the speed of light, and then even light cannot escape. So in fact, from this point mass, you find there's some distance at which, if you're out here with a good enough speed, you can escape. If you're here, you need a bigger speed to, speed to escape. But if you come down to this radius indicated by the dotted line, from there, the escape velocity actually becomes the speed of light, and nothing can get out. So this is called the horizon. The horizon is the place beyond which you cannot see. So you cannot see beyond this from in here, no, light cannot escape. So nothing in here can actually be seen from the outside. So you draw this dotted line as a demarcation. But it's not like there's anything there, at least at this point in our story. Everything is really shrunk down to this point, And you've reached a point of infinite density. Now, this is really very strange, because you never get infinite densities or any infinities in normal physics. But you had a runaway collapse, where something is runaway, shrinks, makes it shrink more, makes it shrink more. You reach infinite density. It's an amazing thing. And you might wonder if such things actually exist. So this is actually something, uh, observations taken from the center of our own galaxy. You can see the stars here. And that's the ear clicking on this out here. So you take images and put them together. And you can see the tracks of these stars are bending quite sharply around this point over here. But the star here is only to mark the point. There's no light coming from there at all. But this object is very heavy. From the size of these orbits, you can actually guess the mass of what is sitting in there. And that's about 1 million times the mass of the sun. So there's something worth 1 million times the mass of the sun sitting there. But there's no light coming from it. The light's only in the stars. And that object is a black hole. So these bizarre things actually exist. And here is an observation. OK, what is the puzzle uh, concerning black holes? What did Stephen Hawking show us? Let's learn something about that. The most important thing about gravity, which creates all our problems, is that gravity is an attractive force. So of course, we know that. You know, if you jump off a building, you'll fall down and hurt yourself. So anyway, here's a mass, little m. Here's a mass, big M. And they attract each other. And you can recast the fact that they have an attractive force in terms of the potential energy between them. And in high school physics, you might have seen this formula. The potential energy between two masses is minus the Newton constant, the first mass, the second mass. But you divide by the distance. So as they come closer, you get more and more negative potential energy. But that looks very interesting, because what happens if you make the distance go all the way to 0? Then the potential energy becomes infinitely negative. And you could, because total energy is conserved, you could extract energy from this system. And so you could get energy out of nothing. You can make the energy go down to minus infinity and extract as much energy as you want. Well, in a way, that's what you do when you have a hydroelectric power station. You let the water fall down, and the potential energy goes down, and the kinetic energy comes in, which you extract, and you get power. So what saves us from actually being, prevents us from actually taking r to 0? Well, that's because the Earth has a finite size. It has a radius of you know, a diameter of about 8,000 miles. So once this thing comes close enough to the surface, then this formula doesn't work. It's a different formula. So r cannot be made smaller than the size of the Earth. Otherwise, you could really extract as much energy as you wanted. Now, but if the Earth is really crushed down to a point, well, that would be much better. Then you can get really close, and you can get as much energy from it as you wanted. Have you ever seen mass crushed to a point? Well, we just saw it a second ago. And let's see what that implies. So in a black hole, the mass has already gone to a point, And let's see what the consequence that would be. So suppose you have a mass here called this capital M. And here's the test mass little m. And they are at a distance r. This is the setup we were just talking about. This mass m by itself, Einstein told us it has an energy inside it, E equals mc squared. So we all know that it's a positive number. OK, you can compute, see what it is. But because of the gravitational attraction between them, we said there's negative gravitational potential energy minus g, the first mass, second mass, and there's the r. So if you add the two, the intrinsic energy and the potential energy, that's the total energy of this guy. And now you see something very interesting about this expression. As you make r smaller and smaller, the negative part grows. And the whole thing, total energy actually becomes 0 at this particular value of r. 
if you make r even smaller, the total energy becomes negative. And all our puzzles are going to come from exactly what you see in this picture. So here's this mass, big M. If I take this test mass and put it inside this critical boundary measured by this radius, this critical boundary will turn out to be what I had called the horizon before. If I put it inside, its net energy is negative. And what does that mean? So now you see, if, of course, we should use all this properly with general relativity because we really have speed of light in there, so shouldn't use Newtonian gravity, which is all non-relativistic, but it doesn't really change the answer. Our critical radius was gm by c squared on the previous slide. It just gets an extra factor of two. It becomes two gm by c squared, but everything else is the same. If you get in there, the net energy is negative. But now see the remarkable consequence of this. I take this object of mass m, and I add something inside this critical circle, and now, even though I've added something, the net energy of this is less than the energy of this. Of course, E is mc squared, so the net mass of this is less than the mass of this. I added something, and my mass went down. OK, there's nothing deep here. I have just used the fact that gravity has a negative potential energy. Energy is mass. I've added something, but the net energy, the thing went down. Well, I can put more of those guys. Let's keep playing the game, because it's an interesting game. Who stops me from playing it? and I bring the overall mass down to zero. So look, I have two things in here. I first put a huge mass in here. No one stopped me from choosing how big it was. And then I put little guys in, but close enough so that the negative gravitational potential energy was more than the mc squared cost of each of these guys to start with. And the total energy went down and down. And I made this huge guy and doesn't have any mass. It's massless. OK, there seems to be no obvious way of getting out to it. But the existence of this very simple thing is the entire root of the uh, root of all the troubles we are going to have that Stephen Hawking is going to get us into. These objects are called remnants for reasons I'll just, just tell you. And if these form, physics would be quite weird. Because if you do a collision, you collide two particles, what comes out? The massless particle like photons are the ones that come out the easiest. If there are all these remnants for around, instead of creating photons in a small interaction, you create these guys instead. How many of them are there? Well, actually, there are infinitely many. You could have started with any amount of mass in the middle and then canceled it down to zero by this method, you can make an infinite number of these guys. They will dominate every process and mess up any physics that you have ever seen. Something must be wrong here. And yet all the steps we have taken are in front of you. They all look completely transparent. OK, so let's see what is the puzzle. Well, it may be that we actually can't do this. Maybe we can't make these guys, because I said, take this guy and put it in there. How do you put it in there? Can you really stretch your hand inside a black hole and put something? Maybe you can't. So you have, you have to see, how do you ever make such a guy? Can you ever make such a guy? And this is where Hawking's work came up. Hawking's discovery of what is called Hawking radiation. Not only can you make these guys, they actually make themselves. In quantum mechanics, the vacuum, like suppose you think of this room, room as being empty, it's not really empty. It's just bubbling around with stuff because of quantum mechanical fluctuations. In quantum mechanics, everything fluctuates. But the way, what's the nature of those fluctuations? So out from this vacuum, you might create an electron and positron pair, which might just come out. It costs you energy because it's mc squared for this, mc squared for this. But there's an uncertainty principle which says you can actually borrow some energy from nowhere, as long as the time for which you borrow it is less than or equal to the value which makes the product of delta E and delta T, the energy you borrow, and the time for which it lasts less than or equal to the Planck constant h bar. So you can have these little fluctuations. You can get an extra pair of particles which wasn't there. As long as you annihilate them back very quickly, you can create them and then annihilate them back. If you do it quickly enough, well, those fluctuations will have to happen. That's the uncertainty principle of quantum mechanics. It's actually happening all around us. It's just built into what we call the vacuum. So it doesn't bother us. But now see what happens if the fluctuations are occurring near a horizon. A particle inside has net negative energy. We saw that. A particle outside has net positive energy because the sign changed across this critical boundary. So look at a fluctuation like this. It will have total energy equal to 0. And then what does the uncertainty principle tell me? How long will this fluctuation have to last before it has to recombine? It never has to recombine because then delta t can be infinity. So just quantum mechanical fluctuations, and now I have just created this particle for me. And now, because energy is already balanced, they don't have to actually recombine. This guy who is outside it can just drift out. The guys inside can just fall in. And so the black hole keeps emitting stuff. 
and that is called Hawking radiation. So, Hawking's main discovery was that black holes emit particles, they are just keeping on emitting particles by a quantum process, but you have seen the entire process in front of your eyes here. And if you cannot find anything wrong with this process at this stage, we are already in trouble, because this process we will see leads us to the information paradox. If we cannot find anything wrong with what has happened here, either the step of making the black hole or letting these particle pairs create. If, if both these steps are exactly going to be the way they are here, we will see that quantum mechanics is not going to work. But in fact, all the steps are right in front of you, so the puzzle is really very transparent. And now you can see the entire Hawking process. As I said, this guy is going to drift out, and after some time, another fluctuation happens, and the other particle can drift out. This time, maybe the electron went out and the positron stayed in. This time, maybe the positron went out and the electron stayed in. But in the end, basically, the radiation collects over here, and this guy basically makes exactly the kind of thing we had called a remnant. It has all the mass we had to start with in the beginning, and it has all these negative energy guys placed right in there. Total mass you can see is going down. Energy is conserved. This guy has energy. This guy has energy is going down because negative particles. Energy is conserved, but we are producing all this stuff. That's the radiation coming out. And so this guy is what remains behind, so it's called a remnant. But in the end, the black hole is shrinking and shrinking. So when it's gone, well, that's where you have to ask what happens. Because the black hole is going on doing this. At some point, if this goes away, it's not something very little. All the things we sent to the black hole in the beginning, they are here in this dot. You remember, they all vanish into a dot. Not only that, we've added more stuff. You can see all these guys that came in, they had negative energy. And the black hole is trying to evaporate and disappear. A lot of stuff is trying to disappear. How is that possible? If something is big and has a lot of stuff in it, how can it disappear? It is big, but its total mass zero. And why is total mass, how can total mass be zero? Energy, everything has mass pump equals mc square, but the gravitational potential energy has a negative sign, and the two things cancel, it has no mass. If you have no mass, can there be anything there? Well, that is exactly the question. Here you have guys with have no mass, and can they disappear? Will they stay? What's going to happen at this point? You can see we have all our puzzles. So let's come and concretize our puzzle that we are going to face now. So we make the star, first we make the black hole by taking some star, letting it shrink in. But I could start with different kinds of stars. One star might have more carbon, one might have more iron, and let's say when one star collapsed, it made the red dot, when the other star collapsed, it made the blue dot. In each case, all the stuff gets cleaned out. It's just the vacuum around the horizon. You get the vacuum fluctuation, then you produce these particles, and they radiate out. The guy becomes smaller, and the radiation collects here. And in the end, let's assume the guy is gone. It was trying to go away. Let's assume it's gone. And now you can see what the puzzle is. Because all the information of what we started with went in here, whether it was a red dot or a blue dot, the two different kinds of stars. But the radiation came out from near the horizon. It came out from the vacuum. And the vacuum was the same in both cases, because the vacuum is a unique thing. So the radiation that came out had no information about whether it was coming out from the red dot star or the blue dot star. So when you end the process, this radiation you have at the end, it doesn't actually know whether you start with the red dot star or the blue dot star. So your energy has been recovered. Nobody said energy conservation is violated. All the mass in the red dot in the end has ended up in the radiation. Or if you had the blue dot, all the mass is over here. Energy is conserved. But your information has disappeared. The radiation came out from a place which didn't know anything about whether you had started with the black hole with the red dot or a black hole with the blue dot. And now you can see of how all the different pieces of the black hole have gone into this puzzle. If the red dot, red stuff, whatever this initial star was, hadn't shrunk to a point, then this guy would have, suppose it was hanging around here, then this particles coming out here and these particles coming out here could have been different. And then the information would be here. But we said in a black hole, you have runaway collapse, it all goes to the center, and then if the vacuum is going to produce something, it really has no information. So the fact in the black hole, everything went in, and then the fact that at the horizon, things change sign, we check that, and therefore, you can get vacuum fluctuations. Every piece goes into this puzzle, but at the end, you can see you have lost information. Is it good to lose information? No, it's terrible. Nowhere before in physics have we ever lost information. In classical physics, you can take you know, a pool table, send some balls here, and they seem to get all randomized. You might have lost the nice information of how you had encoded them, but not really. If you look carefully at all the balls that went out, if you just turn the directions around, they'll go and neatly assemble themselves back into this position. You never lose information. You just have to be careful enough to track back where it came from. 
and that is true even in quantum mechanics because if you take a wave function, quantum mechanics everything is a wave, it evolves and changes to some other shape of a wave and there is an equation that does it for you, the Schrodinger equation will do that. But the Schrodinger equation is completely reversible. If you take this wave and you follow it back, you will uniquely get back to this wave. So you never lose information. You can distort information from one form to the other, but you never lose it. But now we can summarize the entire puzzle we are having in this one slide. You can start with, let us say, a red star and let us say a blue star. That makes this thing with a red dot. This makes the black hole with a blue dot. The information has gone to these dots, but the energy comes out of the vacuum because literally pulled out of the vacuum because of these vacuum fluctuations. So what ends up here and what ends up here? In neither case can it be different because it does not know anything about this or this. It carries no information about the star. And so Hawking told us in 1975, just a year after finding his radiation, the process of black hole formation, first he had to make it and then evaporation, then he had to evaporate it. It violates quantum mechanics because in quantum mechanics, you never lose information. You can always turn it back. So it's not that we don't know the correct dynamics to use for the black hole. It can involve quantum gravity or something we don't know about any new force, but it doesn't matter. Everything in quantum mechanics is always reversible. And here we have seen the process not reversible. So he said it's not a question of the fact that we don't know the right way to do quantum gravity yet. Whenever you are done with your theory and you find quantum gravity, it will actually not respect the tenets of quantum mechanics as we know it. Now, as you can imagine, this made everybody very miserable. Hawking was happy with this, by the way. But nobody else was really happy because you don't really want to lose the fundamental principles of quantum mechanics. And people kept thinking that something must be wrong with this argument. It's just this one bizarre thing, the black hole who's doing this. And one day we'll get out of it. Let's get along with our everyday job and not worry about it. But years and years passed, and nobody could find anything wrong with any step of this argument. And they really tried. And you can see why it's so hard to find anything wrong with it, because everything looks so straightforward. When something is so big, like a star, it's basically the domain of classical physics. And the fact that's going to shrink under its own gravity, you can't stop that. People couldn't find a way to stop that. And then the fact that these particles will be produced like these particle pairs, it's elementary quantum mechanics. In fact, we're doing it in the lab every day. We've checked this out thoroughly in our accelerators in our labs, that kind of pair, producing pairs from the vacuum, the fluctuation of the vacuum, they have been measured time and again. We know them all down to the last precise number. Separately, both these things are true. In classical mechanics, the black hole is forming. and quantum mechanics, there are fluctuations. Of course, nobody measured Hawking radiation because you can't go near a black hole and see these little, little particles come out. It's not practical to do that. But what step is wrong here? People couldn't find this out. And our goal now is to solve this particular puzzle. So let's just make sure before we solve the problem that we really understand what led to the puzzle. So if you just have a star, it has a normal surface, and the radiation comes from the surface. So if you have two different stars, one like this, one like this, you can see the surface is a little different. And therefore, they radiate a little differently. If the surface of one atom has, one star has this kind of atom on it, then that atom comes out. If the other star has the other kind of atom on it, then that atom comes out. It's not the same. But here, because you have uh, the energy, all the particles coming out of the vacuum, well, that's why it's the same. So the first thing you might think of is why don't I think of the black hole as being something different? Maybe the black hole also has some stuff hanging out around its surface near the horizon, and then different things will come out from different kind of stuff near the surface, and then I'll have no puzzle. So that much is clear. But it turns out that it doesn't work, because if you try to put anything near the horizon of a black hole, the gravity there is so strong, it just gets sucked in. So people kept trying to play this game and see if they could put something near the horizon of a black hole to put some information there, to make a surface there. If there was a surface there, it would be like a normal star, and different surfaces radiate differently. There's no information to lose. You just don't want the vacuum there. But whatever they put, it kept falling in. And you kept getting back the same vacuum as before. And this became very frustrating. So the person, John Wheeler, he coined the phrase, black holes have no hair. They're always bald. They're in a unique state where everything goes to the center, and the whole thing just looks like the vacuum. All black holes are identical. The moment you give me the mass, I know everything about its structure. And if that is true, then you definitely have just the shape, and you get the vacuum over there, and there's nothing you can do about that. Well, then can you alter the pair creation process? And as I was just saying, this is a very well-known process in physics. Similar things are being done in atomic physics every day, in particle physics all the time. We know that vacuum fluctuations are definitely part of physics, and that they behave in this fashion. So how do we solve this puzzle? So string theory has to come and give us an answer, because string theory is a theory of quantum gravity. 
it's based on the normal rules of quantum mechanics. If by the time you come and make black holes in string theory, and you still have this problem that you lose information, uh, then it can't respect quantum mechanics, and string theory is gone. So all string theories are out of business if they can't solve the black hole problem. Okay, so we have to find a solution. For us, it's not a choice. So let's see what happens. So a lot of people have worked on this thing, which I'm going to show you, called the first ball paradigm. I just put some of the people who are actually working on it right now. And I want to show you the kind of picture which actually emerged. And the picture is interesting because it will lead to a radical change in what we think the black hole looks like. And from what we've been saying, we can already guess what we want the change to be. We don't want the black hole to be such that everything has gone to the center and there's just the vacuum outside. We really want a surface there. And our problem is whatever you put there, it just falls in. And now let's see if we can get past that. So in ordinary uh, particle physics, particles can be thought of as little dots. But in string theory, as you might guess, objects are strings. Instead of particles, you have strings. So they are what are called extended objects. They have size. And they can be instead of one-dimensional objects, they could be two-dimensional sheets or three-dimensional sheets. Those are called brains, like the sheets are just called brains and so on. So you have lots of objects, but the important thing is they're not point-like, they have a size. Okay. So why does size matter? If you have a, a, an object with a certain size, there are two things that you can do to it when you add energy into it. If you put energy into a point particle, it just goes faster. It's kinetic energy. If you put energy into an extended object like a string, there are two choices. You can either make it go faster, or you can use it to stretch the guy. And now you see something interesting can happen. When things fall into a black hole, they just rush in, and they go to the central dot. But if you take a lot of mass to make a big black hole, it's possible that if the black hole is made of strings, if particles just rushed and made a black hole, if it was made of strings, does it really have to go here? Or if the energy actually goes into stretching the string, but then it's different. The more energy you put, instead of becoming more dense and trying to go in, it may want to stretch and expand. And if it expands enough under that stretching, it may never actually fall into this critical radius and ever make a black hole. Maybe it always remains like a ball. Let's just see what happens. So we are what actually turns out, we start looking at these calculations in string theory, we found that instead of actually going down to a point, these, the energy actually goes into stretching those guys. And as they stretch, they become big. And the way the numbers uh, turn out, the size to which these objects become is just comparable to the size which we thought this entire horizon would have. So they're not shrinking. Somehow in string theory, you are not getting the black hole. Well, let's explore the structure of this a little more. If there's so much gravity in here, why isn't it pulling the surface in? What's holding it there? That was the whole point. You can always make a blob, but everything gets sucked in. Why is it not falling in? That's the real crucial question. And I want to show you why the thing is not falling in. The reason it's not falling in really uses a very important property of string theory. As you know, string theory lives in 10 dimensions. But we only see three space and one time dimension around us. And what that means is there are many extra dimensions. They're very small. That would be like little, little circles, so we can't actually take a walk in them. But they are around us, and they are tiny little circles. And normally, you ignore them. They are in this room. They are doing they are everywhere. But they're doing their own business, little circle. But as we walk, we don't actually crawl around the circle. We just go like this. Uh, but now you'll see that something will actually happen because of the extra dimensions. So just to first recall our puzzle, we have this mass in here. If you come within the critical radius, this is the critical radius, your net energy, mc squared minus the gravitational potential energy, would be negative. That was our puzzle. Instead of the drawing, trying to draw a picture in three dimensions, let me just draw one space dimension for simplicity. I just drawn it as a line, and it's the same puzzle. There's the mass, this is the critical radius I marked out on both sides, the horizon radius, and if you come in here, you have net negative energy. It's just the same puzzle. I just drew one dimension for simplicity. But now if you have extra dimensions like this little compact circle, then I drew it for you. And now the dimension, uh, the whole thing looks not like a line, but like a drinking straw. Okay? It looks like a drinking straw. And up to this point, people were, of course, aware of compact dimensions for a long time, so they didn't do anything with this. It looked like something pretty irrelevant, because the compact circle would be something like Planck size. This whole structure of the black hole is like several kilometers. So who cares? You still put a mass in the middle. There'll still be this horizon on the two sides. And if you come in here, you should have negative energy. People thought the compact dimensions really made no difference. But actually, there's something you can do with the straw, which you couldn't have done with the line, which is radically different. And let's see what you would do. Take the same straw as before. And this was the radius we call the horizon radius. Take a pair of scissors and chop off this piece from here and throw it away. 
the entire interior of the black hole is not part of space time. We'll discard it. Now, how can you just chop off a piece of space time and lose it? What about the open ends you get? You can't just come up to there and then say, I have no place to go. You can't fall off the edge of space time, but you won't. Because you take this, this edge, you can close it off smoothly like a cigar with a cap, and you close this thing off with a cap. And now you can see you have a completely smooth space time. If you come from this side, you don't fall off the edge. You come here and you go back here. If you come from here and you go back here. But there's no inside to fall into because there is no inside. This is a whole new topology. And you didn't have this possible topology if you didn't actually have this extra dimension. If I just had a line and I threw off the middle segment, when I come to that endpoint, I will fall over. But if I had an extra dimension, I have a smooth cap, I come here and I go right back here. And this is the actual structure of the black hole that you get in string theory. So if you actually take a lot of mass and you accumulate it, instead of getting the kind of picture I was showing you before, where you simply have uh, all the mass sitting here, and there's a horizon, there's a region where you can put negative energy things, the whole thing morphs into something else because these strings stretch, they're going to change everything. What do you get at the end of the day? What you get at the end of the day is this structure. And what happened to all the mass that you had, the red dot in the middle carrying all the mass of the black hole? If that middle region is not there, there's no place for that mass. But this region is curved. And gravity, mass, and curvature are connected. And this curvature over here costs energy. And the, through the relation E equals mc squared, all the energy in this curvature and this curvature that's what the mass of the black hole was. So this is the actual structure of the black hole you get in string theory. And you can see it's radically different. But with this new structure, this was in the one dimensional example. But now you can see how it looks like in many dimensions. Suppose you take this room, and you want to make a black hole in the middle. We'll take a whole ball from the middle of this room and throw it away. It's not even part of space time. But now suppose you come at it from any one direction. Previously, we had only two directions. Now I can come at it from any angular direction. As I come near that end, I can just put this cap in there. So this, I come there. I don't fall into that hole. I just come there, and I go right back. I come this way, and I go right back. And when you actually look at what state the strings make for, uh, in string theory, when you put the mass enough to make a black hole, instead of shrinking to the usual thing with a dot in the middle and a vacuum around it, this is what you actually end up getting. I just draw this picture like this. But remember, this is not part of space time. There's nothing there. Space actually ends here. And I just draw this, this wiggles to just show that something happened as you came near the surface. This quantity, this object you get this way, is what we call the fuzz ball. So we find that all the states of the black hole, all the different things you could do with the strings to make a black hole, they all have the structure of fuzz balls. There are actually many, many different fuzz balls. Because when you actually add this cap in there, you can put the cap with many different shapes. It doesn't have to be just a simple round cigar. You can actually have a clockwise twist or an anti-clockwise twist, just something a little technical, but I just put here with pluses and minuses. So in every different direction, you can choose a clockwise or an anti-clockwise twist. There are many different possible states for the black hole. And that will be very important in a minute. So here's another depiction. If you just had a star, it bends spacetime a little bit, curves it. Normal picture for black hole was it to get a horizon. It tears a hole in spacetime, and there's a singularity inside. But now, actually, the horizon never forms. The whole thing ends here. There's no inside region. It's just like the surface of a star. It sort of just ends here. And this, is, this part over here is what I was drawing you as a fuzzball. This surface is this surface over here. And there's no inside to the black hole. There's no singularity. All the problematic things. A singularity was a terrible thing to have in a real theory. It's gone. The horizon was the one creating all the troubles by having this pair production. That is gone. And we actually see the states. And now let's see the crucial question. We at least resolve the information problem. Because in a planet, we had no information problem. It radiates from its surface. And the atoms really see what's there and carry out the information on the surface. The same is true for the fuzz ball. Different fuzz balls have different shapes. And the information goes out from the surface. And you don't get the usual thing where everything makes a vacuum around here. And the actual radiation happens from particle pairs being pulled out of the vacuum. That process is not the true process of how black holes vanish. That looks like a beautiful solution. So you might say, with string theory, we have come and solved the problem. But we had this about 10 or 15 years ago. But not everybody was convinced it's the right answer, because after all, this is a radical change in the structure of the black hole. And you should ask a logical question. If quantum gravity normally operates at very small distances, the normal scale of quantum gravity is supposed to be 10 to the power minus 33 centimeters. A black hole is like several kilometers in size. Why would quantum gravity come and change something on these scales? That's the question we have to answer. If you really can understand why this happened, we would really have understood how such a thing could ever happen. 
but people also didn't focus on the uh, first ball construction that much in the beginning because they thought they had an alternative solution. It's very interesting that they thought there was an alternative solution to the problem, but now we know that solution wasn't right. But it's very interesting to know what that alternative solution was. And it's something called the idea of small corrections. So what's the postulate of small corrections? We did say a pair came out of the vacuum, and the vacuum is the same for a star of one kind and of another kind. But in any case, there could be a small difference between them, because the vacuum of one, there could be some small long range effects. We said this is very far from this, could be three kilometers for a solar mass black hole. There could still be small differences. I've drawn some rather large differences here, but just to show you, but they could be a little bit different. You can see that over here. Now suppose every particle that came out had a little bit of difference, depending on whether you had a red dot in the middle or a blue dot in the middle. It's still coming out of the vacuum, but you can see a small difference in there. But so many particles are going to come out before a black hole evaporates. There'll be trillions and trillions and trillions of particles coming out. Could it be that there is some delicate encoding of data in these small little corrections, which in the end actually capture all the information of whether you had a red dot or a blue dot? If that could be true, then Hawking was making a fuss for nothing in 1974. Because you, know, you do first a leading order calculation and you see information not coming out, but maybe you never took care of the small corrections to your calculation. And if those corrections were enough in number because there are so many particles coming out, then maybe the information was there all the time, you just didn't look carefully. And in fact, there was no Hawking paradox. And in fact, as it turned out, in 2004, you might have heard in the press that Hawking surrendered his bet, which he had taken with John Preskill. Preskill had been saying information is not lost, though I don't know how it's not lost. And Hawking and Kip Thorne, another relativist, had said, no, no, information is lost in black holes. And Hawking said, I think maybe these small corrections do uh, finally, maybe they do the job, so maybe it's okay. And so he paid off the bet, which was a bunch of sports encyclopedias, and he actually sent them over to Preskill. And Kip Thorne actually refused to pay. He said, look, you haven't shown me anything. If you want to say that these small little corrections somehow invalidate the real argument, at least show me that they do that. But it's very hard to actually check that, because so many particles are going to come out. Each one can be subtly different in some way. And you have to check whether they can or cannot encode the information. How do you ever check such a thing? So it's very funny, a situation that two reading physicists, one agrees that he might have been wrong, and the other says, I don't agree, and they couldn't resolve it. But you can see why it's a difficult thing to resolve, because you don't even know what corrections you need. So it turned out that uh, there's a very interesting theorem in quantum information theory. It's called the strong subattitude inequality. Uh, it's by two people called Lieber and Ruskay. And this theorem actually has a lot of power, because it tells you how you actually encode information in delicate quantum correlations. There's some inequality in how much you can encode by what you can do. And that's why the inequality you can see this inequality sign, and if you had many systems, A, B, C, and D, how do the informations correlate, correlate with each other? That's contained in this theorem of quantum information theory. And it turns out if you actually use that particular theorem, you can prove, which is something I managed to do in 2009, that it doesn't matter how you try to make little delicate corrections to each pair, you actually cannot solve the problem. So for example, if you make only corrections of 1% at each step of the emission, even though you might emit trillions and trillions of particles, the number of particles doesn't really matter. You'll never get more than twice that information. If you put 1% corrections, you'll never get more than 2% of the information out. You can prove that by this inequality. I just wrote that in this slide. If the corrections at each step are of order epsilon, epsilon could be like you know, 0.01, 1%, then the fraction of information that can be encoded is less than or equal to 2 epsilon. Be 2%. So then you actually cannot fix it by this method. And so now we have a real problem. If we don't completely change the structure of the black hole, we can't solve it. And because you know, the problem always was that you couldn't change the structure of the black hole in classical physics uh, and ordinary physics. But with string theory, we have changed the structure. This theorem proved you do need to change the structure completely. Small corrections won't do it. In string theory, you found in all the cases you worked out the structure does change. So we might as well take that solution. So that's why I think the first ball solution is the correct one. Even though it looks like a radical change to the physics, in string theory, every state you try, it always swells up into a first ball. It's true we can't check all the states for all the black holes. It's an uh, enormous technical problem, and we can't check that. But we know that we need that change there. Small corrections won't do. We need a complete change. And in all the examples we work out, we do get the complete change. So it looks plausible to assume that all states of all black holes are actually first balls. Now we come back to the question I was just mentioning to you. 
you still have to explain to somebody who is a skeptic, how did physics which happens at the quantum gravity scale, string theory is supposed to not change everything, anything on the scale of meters, or in fact, in this case, kilometers, and yet somehow we are finding that everything has radically changed all the way up to the horizon, and the horizon could be very big for the mass, for the, uh, the mass, uh, one million solar mass in the center of our galaxy. For that kind of a black hole, the radius is about one million kilometers. There it has changed over a million kilometers. So we have to answer this question, how did quantum gravity become so important? So here's the puzzle again. The black hole is an astrophysical sized object, and quantum gravity effect should operate at this tiny scale, and for a solar mass black hole talk of three kilometer distance from here to here, how can the structure change so radically? For that, we go back to what I was mentioning at the start of the talk, the work of Jacob Bekenstein. So Bekenstein had noticed an odd fact. You might have heard about the second law of thermodynamics, which says that entropy always increases. Entropy is the amount of disorder in the, in the universe, and that doesn't go down, it can only go up. But here's the funny thing you can do. Take a box containing some gas, and that has some entropy. And you take the box of gas, and you throw it into the black hole, it will go inside, it will disappear into singularity, and there's the black hole, it's gone. So well, now you can't see the gas, so have you decreased the entropy of the universe? Have you violated the second law of thermodynamics? Now nobody wants to violate the second law of thermodynamics, they love that law. Okay. So what has gone wrong? Well, obviously it doesn't look like a good argument so far, because you could take the box of gas and throw it into a trash can, and close the trash can, but you haven't decreased the entropy of the universe, the entropy of the trash can has gone up. So the entropy of the black hole should have gone up, and what he noticed was, well, I can't see entropy, that's the difference. In the trash can, if you look and you will see the gas, and you can see the entropy has gone up. In the black hole, it all goes to a dot, and you can't see anything, that is true. But at least the black hole has become bigger. So you should at least know how much entropy you should assign to the black hole, though you can't actually see what's causing that disorder. There doesn't seem to be any disorder, it's so orderly, it's just empty, all except for the dot. But in any case, you should assign some entropy to save the second law, and what he found was there's a very precise formula. If you give an entropy proportional to the area of this surface, in fact, measured in units of Planck length squared, if you put all those numbers in, you get just the right entropy so that when you try to decrease the entropy of the rest of the universe by throwing something in, the black hole becomes bigger, and the entropy of the black hole compensates for what you lost over here, and you have saved the second law of thermodynamics. What a beautiful argument. You cannot, cannot see anything inside a black hole. You thought you had no way of ever defining an, or even assigning an entropy to this guy, and this simple argument tells you, not only should the black hole have an entropy, you even get a number. If you want to save the second law, you know exactly how much entropy it should have. But this actually raised another puzzle, which is what I had said is the puzzle raised by Bekenstein's work. As we said, entropy is a measure of disorder. The atoms in a gas can be in this position, or that position, or that position, and the number of different positions they can have, if that number is n, the log of that number is called the entropy in the box. How many states does the black hole have? It seems to have just one state. Everything has gone to a dot in the middle, and the rest is empty. If I put one for n, what is log of one? Actually, log of one is zero. So in fact, we get a zero entropy. On the other hand, we had a formula for the entropy on the previous slide, and there you can see it again. And if you put in all these numbers, notice there's an h bar at the bottom, the Planck constant, which is very small. And if you put all these numbers in, and there's a c cube at the top, speed of light cube, that's a very big number. If you put all those numbers in properly, you find the entropy of the black hole is actually huge. A black hole should have 10 to the power of 10 to the power of 77 different possible states. And here we find it has only one state. Something has gone wrong. It's even much bigger than the mass, than the entropy of the sun. The sun has only 10 to the power 10 to the 58 states because the power of a power, this is very tiny compared to this. A black hole has an enormous entropy and we can't see it. So this was the puzzle. What is the, what is the entropy of black holes? Why is it so large? And what does that imply? So black, so Bekestan was sitting with this puzzle. He could assign entropy to the black hole, but he couldn't see what were the different states which were giving him that entropy. But now we can actually see what it was. We in fact have all these little, little structures on the side, and if you count how many of these are, you find they're exactly the right number. In all the cases where we can explicitly check, they exactly give you back the Bekestan entropy. We can't check them for all kinds of black holes, that's difficult to do. For the simplest ones, when you check it, you get exactly the right number of these states. So now we understand what we were supposed to be counting. But this time we actually have a surface, it's all the different possible surfaces that we are counting. And that makes perfect sense so far. And now we let's see if we can try to answer our question, 
why did the black hole change so radically? So if you have just classical physics, you have a star, it shrinks under its gravity, it goes to a point. We've done that before. Why should that change? Well, so you take this particular star, and as the star is collapsing, there's a small quantum mechanical fluctuation possible where it changes into the state of a fuzzball. Well, of course, that's a sort of trivial statement. There's a small probability for anything to happen in quantum mechanics. There's a very tiny probability that I'll just vanish from here and appear on the other side of this wall. It's called tunneling. But why don't I worry about it? Because the probability is so small. It's just a fluctuation. So of course, everybody knew that anything can fluctuate to anything. Why would you care? But now there is a funny thing which is happening. This is, of course, a very small probability. It's a very massive object going to another very massive object. There's almost no uh, probability of happening. But you have to multiply by the, all the possible final states that you want to go to. I might want to fluctuate towards across this wall to go here, or fluctuate across this wall to go here, or across the roof to go up. There are some possibilities, but there are only six possibilities here. Multiplying the probability by six doesn't do much for me. But the number of these guys is enormously large. We just said the Bekenstein entropy is so phenomenally large that we actually can't understand it. And as it turns out, if you multiply by the number of possible final things you can go to, by the very small probability of actually going to any one of them, the large number exactly cancels the small number. So that's the incredible thing which is happening. Bekenstein was sitting with this puzzle. I had this huge entropy, and I can't see any of those states. So there were two puzzles there, really. Why is the entropy so huge? It's much bigger than the entropy of any normal matter. We have seen it comes from all the little quantum gravity scale little fluctuations over here from all the different ways you can pinch off the little uh, circles in space time. But because the entropy is so large, the normal effects of quantum mechanics, which are so suppressed because they're so tiny, they get amplified. Because there's a small probability to do something, but the number of things that you can possibly do is very large. The large number can cancel the small number, and the actual probability becomes order one, and this thing actually changes over to there. And then everything is different. Because now the star doesn't actually end up here. The small probability will leak into this, 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 and overall, there's more chance to go here than to go here. And in fact, you end up getting the first pulse. This one gets completely wiped out. So this is how you actually ended up getting this complete change of the classical picture. And the black hole is really in the domain of quantum theory. But all because of this Bekenstein entropy, the entropy was so large, it changed something classical all the way to something quantum. And that's how we're going to solve this puzzle. Because as long as people thought the black hole is classical, quantum mechanics can't really change anything very much on the scale of several kilometers, there really was no solution to this puzzle. Well, let's then come to the final question that we want to ask. You might have seen in the recent press that people have said there's a firewall at the horizon of a black hole. So what does that mean? It was a general argument of the following kind. If you find some kind of a surface to the black hole, then you'll solve the puzzle, because then stuff can radiate from the surface like a star. If you have the vacuum there, we have seen the puzzle. Can we get a surface outside a black hole? Well, in normal physics, you can't. But in string theory, at least you have the first ball. So there's at least one example using string theory where you actually can get a surface to stay there. It can't fall in in this case because of new topology, there is no inside. But we got a surface. So now you can ask, when you fall into a normal black hole, you keep going in and in till you go all the way through the horizon. It's just a vacuum. You go all the way down to the center and all the way to the singularity. But if you hit a, a surface out there, what happens? When you hit that surface, you just smash, you die. Does that behave like a firewall, like it burns you up? Are we really saying at the end of all this that you, when you fall into a black hole, instead of going smoothly through this horizon, you actually smash on the surface? So you can see this is a logical question to ask at this point. So I've just drawn the question for you here. If an energetic photon is falling in here, it will just go through here, here. This is just a demarcation boundary where the energy change sign, but there's nothing really there in the normal picture. And then you can go all the way down to the center. That was the normal picture. And now we have the surface, so it looks like you'll crash and burn when you hit the surface. On the other hand, we always love to be able to save our classical intuition in some way or the other. Everyone loves their classical intuition. And because classical physics tells us we can go in, somehow we really want to be able to go in. But this time, the inside is not even part of space time, so we can't go in. And so what's the right answer? Is there any sense in which we can even think that there is an insight to the black hole? And it's very interesting that there's a conjecture here based on some old work of Susskind called complementarity, now slightly modified to be uh, in a way. So I'll call it fuzzball complementarity. And it tells you 
even though you fall on the surface and you can't go in and you'll smash into lots of pieces, you may still not feel anything and you may still feel that you're going in. So let's see how that can happen. It's an amazing fact that you might, there's no place to go in and yet you might feel that you're going in. This kind of an idea is called complementarity and it's sort of at the cutting edge of where we are. This is something we don't know if it is true or if it's not true. I hope it is true because it's a beautiful idea. It will allow us to save our classical intuition. Okay, so what's the idea over here? Sometimes two completely different systems can mimic each other. So if you go to a room and you hear the sound of a piano, you might think, hey, there must be a wonderful grand piano over here. But when you actually enter the room, you might find, hey, there was just a keyboard. Now, a piano produces some notes by a vibration of strings. A keynote actually produces notes by electric currents going in circuits. It's completely different. And yet, they actually mimic each other to a very good approximation. Well, could the same be true here? In the classical picture, you came in here, you went in, you went in, that was your system. And here you come here, you hit on the surface, and all you can do is maybe oscillate the surface. If you hit the surface of a water drop, the water drop oscillates. That's all you can do. You can't go in. There's no inside there. Can this one mimic this one? If one guy could mimic the other, or at least approximately mimic the other, then it would be like the piano and the keyboard. And then in some sense, even though we have no inside, we would mimic falling in, and our classical intuition would come back. If this was true, just see what a beautiful thing it is, because space, which wasn't there, can be mimicked by something completely different, which didn't have that space in it. So actually, the an analogy to the piano is even closer, because in quantum theory, every state has an energy E. And from Einstein's work, we know that the energy is connected to the frequency. If you take light of higher frequency, it has higher energy. Like, you know, X-rays have very high frequencies. They have very high energies. So E equals H times the frequency, Planck constant times the frequency, what Einstein taught us. And any physical system is completely characterized by its possible frequencies. So you're getting even closer to how a piano behaves. Right? It's just the frequencies emitted from that particular instrument. Every, every uh, physical object is characterized by some frequencies. For example, an atom is characterized by the frequencies of its various orbits. And what it emits is given by the energy levels, which are given by this formula as the difference between two frequencies of two different orbits. And now, you, therefore, you can ask the question, if I give you two different systems which have the same frequencies, can you tell the difference? And the answer in quantum mechanics is no. This is kind of object is called a duality. It happens all the time in string theory. You have one kind of object which has some frequencies, a completely different object which has the same frequencies, and actually they're isomorphic, and you have a duality. One system can be replaced by the other. And now let's see how that idea might apply to what we are doing. When you fall into a black hole and you're going inside, the whole process of info inside, going inside, everything is a wave. There are some waves inside the black hole. You can look at those waves. You have to see the structure of the black hole to compute them properly. But they have certain frequencies. And then I call them frequency 1 for the black hole, BH is black hole, frequency 2 for the black hole, some list of frequencies. If you hit the surface, you can't go in. You can only vibrate that. But the vibration of the surface has some frequencies. I call them frequency 1 of the first ball, frequency 2 of the first ball. Those are the FBs. I get a set of frequencies. Now, what if these frequencies were to the first approximation equal to these frequencies? But then actually, you can't tell the difference between not going in and just oscillating the surface and actually mimicking the idea of actually falling in. And there is reason to believe that this is what actually happens. There's reason to believe that the fluctuation frequencies, oscillation frequencies of the first ball, are actually the same as the frequencies of waves which are actually falling into the black hole. So now we are reaching the final point of what we do. And the idea of how two frequencies can actually match kind of duality, it came up in a very close related context in this work of Malzacena in 97. If you hit a concrete block, you just smash and you die. Okay, so that we know. But if you take these brains in string theory, and you fall onto it, you oscillate the brains, and they have a certain set of frequencies. But it turns out that if you just had empty space with no brains, but something called anti de Sitter space, a particular kind of curved space, the frequencies of vibration in that are the same as the frequencies of vibration of D brains, and one exactly mimic the other. So you can actually replace brains with space, and that's called the ADS CFT correspondence. You might have heard about it. Malson is very famous for having discovered that brains can be actually replaced by space time. And now we're asking for something very sim similar. There are all the different fuzz balls. So at low energies, at the temperature of the black hole, they radiate differently, and the information goes out. 
But when you hit them hard, when you fall onto something, energy is very high. At high energies, these oscillations are basically the same for all these guys, and they mimic free infall, and so you get the physics of effectively falling in. So I'm basically done, and let me just take a couple of slides to summarize what I have just told you, and uh, let's see if we can wrap it all up together. So first we have seen the information paradox is very serious, and this was the paradox. You take a red star, collapse it, take a blue star, you can collapse it to a dot. In both cases, there's just the vacuum over here, and that radiates stuff, but it radiates the same in both cases, because it doesn't know if you have a red dot or a blue dot, and so it has no information, and then you have violated quantum mechanics. This was the puzzle, and now we have seen everything about the puzzle. What I have told you is all there is in the full technical depth of it. In string theory, we have found that the whole structure of the black hole is completely altered. The inside of the spacetime does not even exist, so you do not actually end up getting this picture. You get actually a surface there which does not fall in, and now you have at least solved the information paradox. Many people thought that these small corrections might encode the issue, and we could still keep the old structure of the black hole. But using these powerful theorems of uh, quantum information theory, we know that is not possible. We can actually prove you need a complete modification of the horizon, not a small modification, and therefore you might as well take the first ball solution. It is a complete modification. You needed one, you have it, even though you cannot check it for all black holes and all states. It looks plausible, that is the way things should work. We had to then answer how did the structure of the black hole change so radically? Classical physics, it seemed, should be almost good almost perfectly good for uh, something as big as a black hole. Why did it change so completely? And we saw the reason. Even the quantum effects are very small on any one transition of this kind from here to here. If there are many of these possible things, there is some probability to go here, some probability to go here, some probability to go here. When you add all those probabilities, the large number of these, this enormous entropy formed by Bekestein for the black hole, that large number exactly cancels the smallness of the transition probability. So you actually end up going here and not going here. Black holes are really much more quantum mechanical than you might ever have guessed. And then our final step, does the first ball surface actually have to behave like a firewall? Will it burn you? Well, if the real surface there, you can't really proceed any further. But falling on the surface oscillates it. These are the oscillations. And if those frequencies are the same as the frequencies of waves inside the black hole, if you fall on it hard enough to get this approximation to work for high energies, uh, you actually can't tell the difference. So you wouldn't know that there's actually a firewall there, you'll feel you're falling through the vacuum. Well, this is my last slide over here. What next? So we have solved the information problem, but in the process, we've completely changed the structure of the black hole. Where do we go from here? And for me, the most exciting question is, we should go to solve the other big singularity we know about uh, in physics, which is singularity at the Big Bang. Very similar. A lot of mass is being crushed down to one dot, just like happened in the black hole. A lot of mass got crushed to one dot, but in the black hole, we found that quantum effects completely changed everything. If that's going to happen here, we need a whole new theory for the Big Bang cosmology, and that's the kind of thing that we are most excited about right now.